I must say that uh, uh, God is going to transform Burundi. So I think we are creating like a wave of people who from below who are given uh, new skills, uh, ability to create uh, wealth, to, to train others, uh, to help those who are poor and needy. Well, welcome everybody. This is Simon Gilbo with Inspired. And this week I have my tallest friend. He is six foot six or two meters. His name's Arne Salter from Norway. Greetings, Arne. Hello, Simon. Good to hear from you. Oh, it's fantastic yeah. to have you. And Arne is a banker. And uh, I asked him for some suggested questions to him. And uh, one of his questions that he sent through was, why would you interview a boring banker? So, Arne, I, I'm really hoping that you're not too boring. In fact, I know you're not boring. And I'm really excited about what you've got to share about uh, how we microfinance. And we'll get more into that in due course. But uh, first of all, well, I mean, I don't, I think through you, obviously, I've met a number of other Norwegians. But before that, the only Norwegians I've ever met were sort of dancing in a street in, in Bangkok, Thailand. So, you know, we Brits and uh, I suppose a lot of, you know, people listening in America and stuff don't know much about Norway. Give us a bit of context to your your upbringing, your background, and yeah, it'd just be good to hear some of the earlier story. Yeah, Norwegians are famous for uh, our drinking and partying, so I was at that level also once. But uh, but things changed when I met the Lord. So, so you want to know the background? Yeah, a, a bit, just a bit of your younger story. You know, from as as you, as you grew up, what are the key moments? Um, I think my uh, key moment to be uh, boring was actually when uh, I was saved. Uh, I was quite a naughty boy. And then someone, uh, a friend invited me to a Christian uh, camp. And then uh, I was introduced to Jesus. I accepted him. And I was totally changed, you know. I was uh, so naughty. I had stolen some books, I remember. And then uh, as soon as I uh, received Jesus, I... I went back, actually, I, I went by a bicycle for uh, four kilometers to, to pay for the books I had stolen. And before, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, like people so much, hmm. uh, very self-oriented. And then suddenly I started loving people. So very strange. And that was what age? 15. Right. And uh, so you, you had otherwise a pretty normal childhood schooling. Were you from a privileged background or what? Yes, uh, normal background in Norway. My father was actually a banker. Mm -hmm. My mother worked in an office and we had a okay flat, uh, a school where uh, where many many people had social problems. So uh, I had to be a fast runner, not to be beaten up uh, on my way home from school every day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Someone was beaten up. So it was a rough area, but uh, in the street where we were living, it was okay. Very nice people. And uh, yeah. And did you do, was it normal, you know, dad's a banker, so I'm going to be a banker university? What was your trajectory? I actually uh, went directly from uh, college uh, to uh, the bank uh, where I was working. I have been working actually for 43 years. Wow. So uh, interrupted by some callings from the Lord. Yeah, actually, I remember when we were doing a we were doing a Zoom weren't we, with a, a few dozen people that are interested in microfinance, and your introduction was that I've been at the same bank for forty three years. I've been married to the same woman for thirty five years, so I'm a faithful kind of guy. Yeah, yes. that was good. Yeah. So, all right, so tell us, you know, how did you get into the, the whole microfinance or banking stuff? Well, start. Let's start with banking. Um, banking was probably because my father was a banker and uh, was able to get the job there. So, uh, and uh, I re- was, they gave me a lot of uh, trust and uh, I grew very fast and got a good job, worked in the financial markets, international financial markets, uh, you know, funding the bank with, uh, yeah, more than 100 million for a tra- transaction. So, uh, so it was uh, very exciting. I had to know everything about uh, financials in the world, you know, is the interest rate going up or down, and currency and everything. So it was so exciting. So, you know, bankers in general get a pretty bad press, particularly it was, wasn't it 2008, 2009. And in general, if you know, is it embarrassing when people say, what do you do? I'm a banker. Is it possible to be a, a, a good banker? 
Yes, it's possible to be a good banker. Uh, actually, when I started working in the financial side, uh, international, then I was uh, asked uh, to uh, tell a lie uh, to one because that would give us a good profit. So I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not willing to do it. Uh, I, I, uh, and they understood because I told I was a Christian. So I said, uh, you, you can say it. Uh, then I said, uh, let's, let us see what happens. Uh, I tell the truth and, and you, you do it your way. And let us see who gets the best results. And after a while, uh, a few years, no one lied anymore. Wow. That's fantastic. I've just been preaching on being salt and light. And uh, I mean, that is the light shining, the salt sort of having that sort of preservative cleansing effect, isn't it? Beautiful. So it's possible to change fundamentally how an organization is run. And that's, it's a big organization you're with, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Uh, 700 uh, employees, but uh, this was a very small part of it. I must say that uh, my colleagues, they are, they are uh, really really honest and i i don't see uh, any problems that you read about in the papers so uh sparbank invest is where i'm working very good bank and we always put customers first so so the culture has totally changed from that time i uh, i shared about now so i don't know how quickly you want to fast forward as we come towards how you felt nailed to uh branch out into microfinance but you know what what led you was it was, was it always a feeling of you know I'm, I'm making money for other people i want to actually do it for the poorest of the poor what, what was your thinking there it was actually uh, in a disciple training school uh, with uh, ywam in uh, 2000 where god called me to go with him to the nations and i um, i said uh, i'm not willing to do that this is just a happening and then we had an outreach to Thailand and Northern Thailand in the hill tribe. I really saw the poverty. And then I, uh, I said to the Lord, okay, if you can use a banker, I don't know how you can use a banker, but if you can use a banker, uh, and if I, you are willing to let me change my mind, uh, then, uh, then I will, uh, I will, uh, glorify you in the nations. And then in 2006, a uh, Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to microfinance, mm-hmm. to Grameen Bank uh, and Muhammad Yunus. And then I understood, wow, I can glorify Jesus in, uh, in a business, in a banking, actually. Mm. So use my talents. So then uh, we founded Hauge Microfinance, actually without money, uh, just with a vision. Uh, five people were, came alongside and we... Uh, and we decided to do, just go for it. That's beautiful. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Starting something uh, with a vision but no backing. Because I found that in, in Burundi, I would often get, I say often every week, I'd get people coming to my office and saying, I've got this great vision. And they'd go through it. And I'd go, wow, this, this, it's an amazing vision, guys. So, so what are you doing about it? And they would invariably say, uh, well, that's why I've come to see you, because I need money to actually implement the vision. And I said, no, right. that is not how it works. Every, every vision, you just start with small steps. And, uh, you know, and they'd be talking to me in our conference center, which cost several, several million to build and lots of fancy cars and all that. And they're thinking, that's what you like, Simon. But actually, I said, no, 23 years ago, I was on a bicycle. I had nothing myself. And I, yeah. it was a borrowed bicycle. I arrived with a few hundred uh, dollars in the world, having had most of it stolen. And so you're saying the same thing, essentially. You know, you started with no money, but the vision and the vision drove people getting behind you. Yes. Beautiful. So, yeah, carry on. So then, yeah, I, I, uh, we went to Burundi. Uh, I was given some money to, uh, for my family, actually, to uh, give us loans to people just to see if uh, it was possible. And why Burundi? Uh, someone asked us uh, to, uh, I can say that the president was saved because a Norwegian preacher was preaching there. Uh, at that time, he was not the president. So then he... Uh, he challenged a um, church if they could go to Burundi and do something for the economy in Burundi. Right. So they went to Burundi and they did uh, a check done to find out. What, and uh, they said microfinance is most needed, but there's so low competence there. So we need someone to have a microfinance best practice seminar. And the only one they knew uh, who were into microfinance was I. 
Mm-hmm. So, and I, I even I wasn't. So, uh, so I went there, uh, and we uh, we invited the uh, Norwegian School of Business, uh, and we went, had a seminar for all the microfinance institutions there in Gitega and one in uh, Burundi in Bujumbura. Uh, and there, actually, I didn't want to be in Burundi, so uh, I want I booked my tickets to stay as long as possible in. Uh, Kenya, because as a tourist, you can do many uh, interesting things there, but not yeah. uh, so much in Burundi. <laughs> but when I was in Burundi, I understood uh, this is where God wants me to be. So I had to repent. I do many mistakes, and this was one of them. Mm-hmm. So uh, so I went back, uh, and then I met with some people, yes. Uh, I went back many times, and uh, I gave those uh, loans that I talked about. They had to be Christian, born again Christian. To get the loan, and even recommended by the church, and I had to have a written business plan. Uh, so I gave out uh, eleven loans, and only uh, one and a half paid back. <laughs> In auspicious start, All right? Very. So, what were the learned lessons from that? Learned lesson is that uh, you don't you need to uh, actually train people. So that's what we found out. We need to train. So we trained hundred and fifty two persons in our methodology. And then we used uh, another microfinance uh, license to give loans and they, uh, 150 paid back. 150 out of? Out of 152. Wow. That's so what, 98, 9% repayment rate, which is even better than Grameen Bank, isn't it? So you're on for a Nobel Prize now? Yeah, because of 150 people, of course. <laughs> I think it takes more. Sure. So, uh, but now we have uh, 20, more than 20,000 customers, and uh, we use this uh, the same. You know, you have to train people. You have to build a strong character. You have to give them uh, business skills, money management. And then uh, you, what you experience is actually you get a relationship, and they, they want to grow. Uh, they get this need to uh, to to succeed uh, and to pay back. So uh, today we have ninety six, almost ninety seven percent payback rate for twenty thousand wow. customers. So good. And you know, I've been obviously engaged in Africa from living out there from twenty three years ago, and I, we are more recently engaged. That's why I was so keen to get you on to talk to us because it, to me it is it is so genuinely exciting and transformational seeing because uh, it's not just individuals, is it? It's it, it's communities, but it's it's people's lives changed, and then they can actually employ other people. And they're given dignity. There are so many things. Uh, sort of positives that come out of it. So it really is the way forward for me, even as we look at all the different things we're involved in. It's uh, It really is powerful. Now, just to backtrack a bit. So, you know, for someone who's relatively clueless, uh, an average person like me, uh, what is mi- microfinance? Explain explain the whole process. I can explain the whole process. Before, be first, uh, maybe it's important to know why it is important. Yeah, with microfinance. For it. Because when we met with uh, some people in, in the government, uh, it was Kato, my cousin and I, he is into uh, fish farming. So uh, this, uh, this uh, minister, he said to us, there are two big needs here in Burundi. One is that very few people have access to financial services. Mm-hmm. And the other one is that we don't uh, have enough food, lack of food. So there we were sitting. He he was able to produce food, uh, fish, and uh, and I was able to give them access to affordable financial services. So uh, and then I was very encouraged. So we, um, yeah, what we do is actually uh, many people they don't have uh, a bank account, they don't have any safe place to place their money. So, uh, so we provide a safe uh, bank account where they can uh, save for the future and, and even the daily uh, money management. Uh, and then the next step is that uh, if you have a business idea, uh, you, you, uh, you need someone to finance this. As you just said, you know, people come to you with this fantastic vision, but no one can finance it. So uh, that's the role of a bank. It's actually to take the risk mm-hmm. to help someone to finance their vision so that the economy can grow and they can become self-sustainable. 
uh, and uh, they can even employ people because not everyone can be uh, an entrepreneur. So many people they have a, they have a, a regular work, you know, they work in a, maybe in a university or a school or they can work in hospital, they can work wherever, and then. Uh, you know the salary sometimes is not uh, does not cover all the needs. You shall pay for school fees for your children and uniform and all these things. And then uh, it's good to have a, a good financial institution institution where you can uh, get a small loan. We call it salary loan, and you pay back in one, two, three months or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's not only for entrepreneurs. Uh, so in in all of us come in in situations in life where we have difficulties and then you need a financial institution to help you to go through it. Yeah. Um, And for context, uh, people wouldn't know this, but it's in Burundi, if you want to borrow money, you're looking at uh, 20 to 24% uh, interest repayments, which is just uh, absurd and uh, quasi impossible you know what what business can succeed from the get-go with those kind of crippling interest rates uh, for repayment so um what what you're offering well what do you offer yeah what uh, what the minister told us that time was that uh they pay 25 percent per month yes oh, uh, unbelievable uh, so he said uh, it's impossible to create a business and create jobs and and for the community to prosper with that kind of uh uh, money management, you know, uh, no one can get access to to uh, to their vis- uh, realize their visions. So, um, so then we had to calculate, you know, in uh, in Norway, when I uh, use my credit card, I pay twenty four percent, and I have a, a good job. Uh, I I am trusted for uh, forty three years. Uh, so, uh, so it's very costly, actually. To receive, uh, first you need a building, mm-hmm. then you need a, a car and motorbikes to go to the to the poor people, uh, then you need a license, you need skilled people, you need uh, people with high education, you need to pay salaries, and then you shall go and give them a loan for hundred dollars. How can that hundred dollars, you know, uh, give you interest rate that covers all those costs? Mm-hmm. That's almost impossible unless you get a high volume. So in the beginning, when you found a microfinance or a bank, you will lose so much money. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, so we, we started calculating. We found out that the 24% that I pay uh, for my credit card is actually uh, what can be a normal rate if we get enough volume in Burundi. So uh, that is 2% per month. So uh, instead of uh, 25 per, per month, it's now still 25, but it's per year. Mm. So you, you did your first fund, 152, 150 repaid. Um, I remember you telling me that you'd started working through the church and you realized the church was really not the vehicle to work through. I mean, that's interesting and rather sad, but explain that. Actually, um, to get the license, you need, uh, you need to do uh, a lot of work. Uh, and uh, it's important to have people uh, locally based uh, who can help you to go through all, all the procedures. And then uh, we were brought to, uh, to a church there, yes. And they, uh, they insisted on helping us and even becoming a partner. And what people tell me about uh, Africa and Burundi uh, is that in the beginning, the local people will be very interesting and always, almost always say, we have the same vision. This is what the church told me also. We have a vision about microfinance. And then they will help you. They will contribute. Uh, but then after a while, they will stop contributing. And this is exactly what happened. We got the license. And then uh, we should uh, distribute our products through the church. And they, uh, we had a really a good agreement. But I never did. Hmm. I was wondering what's going on. Then someone told me the next step will be that they will uh, start uh, to stop you uh, because they want to take over. Hmm. So and and uh, this is exactly what happened. So uh, so this was a really struggle for us. You know, we had really to work uh, hard to get customers, uh, to get volume, so that we can grow. 
uh, and not through our partner. Because actually, after two years, they had one, their members had one account oh, with a, one loan, one loan, only one loan. Hmm. Some people had open accounts, but they were actually stopped. So it was such, uh, so sad for us. And I, this caused me so much uh, energy and uh, problems to, uh, I didn't understand. Mm. Cause you'd expect them to be on your side and yeah, being of course. bitten by yeah. someone in your team. Very depressing. I suppose you've had a lot of discouragements in the mix. Um, was it, were there dark times where you thought I'm just going to give up? Actually not. Uh, you know, they didn't know who, who I was when they, uh, they started <laughs> making trouble because uh, this was founded by the Lord. You must remember, he was the one who called me to do this. I didn't want to do it. Uh, and I just told the Lord all the time, uh, <laughs> I have a prayer room here. So I had to go in and say to the Lord, this is your microfinance. I have given it to you. You are the one who is behind it. You have to solve all the problems for me. So I had such inner peace. I, all the time I was knowing the Lord will handle this. That's so good, isn't it? I, I suppose I'd be similar in terms of if, if you know you're called to do something, then whatever comes your way, you, you can see it not as, a, you know, I'm doing something wrong, I'm actually doing something right, and this is contested, and therefore I've got to push on even more and, and get through. Uh, some people would say, you know, microfinance, um, where, where do we find that in the scriptures? Is there you know, any biblical reference that guides you in terms of how you shape it? Ah. You don't know why you ask, uh, who you're asking. This is, <laughs> the, I tell this to many pastors, uh -huh. and they, in the beginning, they don't believe me. But uh, I'm saying that the disciples, they were also bankers, Jesus' own disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, then you shall ask, how can you say that? Yeah, go on. <laughs> how can it be? <laughs> you know, uh, we can read in the Bible that um, uh, the disciple left their ministry at the tables, uh, for the ministry of um, the, the word from the Lord and the prayers, mm -hmm. yeah? And the ministry of serving by, for, by the tables uh, is actually when you go back uh, and in the history you check, that's banking. So the story is this. In, in Jerusalem, more and more people became Christian. So uh, historians say that around, around 20,000 out of a population of 85,000 became Christian. And this became a threat, of course, for the Jewish and for the Romans, because mm. this new wave of people coming, uh, changing. And then uh, they decided to boycott them, like we do with Iran and others. You mm -hmm. know, They boycott them, so no access to financial services. So the pastors say that when we read in Acts 2.42 that they sold, their, uh, they sold their properties and gave to the disciples, People say, the pastors say that they gave it to the poor. But the Jewish, they are not beggars. And all those people saying, selling their properties, giving to the disciples, was actually because the Jews are very good business people, mm -hmm. and they needed to, uh, to access to finance to continue to run their business. So the disciples actually received those as a deposit, and they gave it as a loan. This is banking, you know, to receive a deposit, from one who's rich or has money, and you give it a loan to someone who has a need. And then they pay back, and they were able to continue to buy their goods and sell it and earn their money. And then, of course, it also says uh, that they gave it to the poor, to poor widows, and there was some arguing between them. But uh, we always have to give, but we also have to use our talents. Jesus is very clear about that to uh, create wealth, to create jobs, and uh, for the community to prosper. Oh, no, I love that. I've spoken on those verses before, and I've never seen that. So what a real insight. I think that'd be an insight for most of us, actually. Hi, folks. I hope you're enjoying all these inspiring stories as much as I am. If you enjoy the podcast, I'd love it if you give us a top quality rating on iTunes so that more people get to hear about it. And if you want to contact me, you can get me on simongilbo.com and the other social media platforms. Now let's get back to the podcast. Um, so, Hauger is the name you've given it. So, who or what is Hauger? Hauger is, uh, the name was given us uh, when we could not agree on a name when we founded the microfinance. Uh, and then I said, okay, let us ask the Lord. We silent one minute and he gave us the same name ever to everyone. Hauger, after a man who lived in Norway 200 years ago. 
His name was Hans Nielsen Hauge. Actually, 250 years since he was born this year. And it's being celebrated all over in Norway this year. Uh, this man, is, uh, he was a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he was a preacher. And he transformed the culture in Norway. We were poor. We were dirty. <laughs> we, uh, Norway is a, is a stone nation, you know. There was is mm-hmm. not much agriculture. So uh, we were under Denmark. And uh, the Danish king was very angry because he didn't get any taxes from Norway because we were so poor. So this man, Hans Nielsen Hauge, went, walked around in Norway or skied, uh, preached the word. Uh, people were saved, stopped drinking, very uh, many alcoholized people stopped drinking, started working on the farm. And then he saw they also need jobs. Uh, so he... God gave him ideas how to create business. Uh, he was, uh, it, was, it was sensational how he, he built up. And he changed actually the business uh, culture as well. He gave good conditions for the workers. He even gave jobs to someone who were disabled or, or uh, needed a job because they were not able. Uh, and he, so he changed actually the, uh, the culture in Norway. So uh, in, uh, when we are now celebrating it, uh, 250 years, uh, uh, people really get their eyes up, uh, opened about uh, this man who transformed Norway. And then uh, I share this story in Burundi, and, and our loan officers, they say, this is our best product. You know, because we share this story, and people say in Burundi, I also want to transform my community. Mm. I want to create jobs. I want to see... Uh, people develop and our community develop so so good i suppose i'm trying to think of an equivalent person in england would you someone like wilberforce or wilberforce was international safe trade wasn't it but um shaftesbury totally fundamentally shaped and sort of um, culture and society and change laws and all that sort of stuff i mean it's not a direct comparison obviously but uh, it's beautiful that it has been done it has been done by followers of christ working out the teachings of christ uh, in different countries and may it happen again in Burundi, in Bangladesh, wherever. Um, now you'll have lots of, uh, good stories, but give us some, some typical stories of, you know, lives transformed, communities transformed. Yeah. When I, uh, when I meet with people who are customers, they, uh, always share this story before I was, uh, <laughs> not able to give, uh, you know, breakfast to my family. I maybe had breakfast for two. We are a family, family of five or seven or eight or ten. And uh, can you imagine the dilemma? You know, uh, who shall have this breakfast for two? Mm-hmm. You know, when when we are ten. And then, um, shall it, will it be uh, those who need to learn? You know, go to school to learn. I've seen children, you know, laying on the floor. Because they could not, they did not have, not have energy, not eaten. Uh, and then, uh, or a mother who was working on the field. And now to see this, they're shining in their eyes, you know, mm. sharing how, because I got uh, this training, because I had this loan, I understood how I could make more money. And then uh, how our family now have two meals. That was actually our goal. Yes. To have two, to see the families have two meals per, per person, uh, every day, mm-hmm. and to see children be able to go to school and have energy at school. Mm-hmm. Oh, now I'm t- even touched. Yeah. Also, I uh, also want to say that um, not not only about that, but one uh, one lady, the happiest lady I ever seen in Burundi. <laughs> You should have seen the smile. It was so beautiful. And I was wondering, what is she saying? Because I didn't understand the language. Uh, I was sure she was sharing something uh, someone gave to her or something, something we have teached her. But then she said, you know, because uh, I'm so happy because uh, I was able to give something, uh, contribute to my group mm. because we train people in groups. And always people had to help me, you know, I was learning, I was learning, I was growing, but I always had to get from, from you or from others. But this time I was able to give, to contribute. And I was thinking, wow, can you be that happy? 
when you are able to give, you know, because uh, sometimes when people ask us to give something, we don't like it, you know, but we shall be so happy when we are able to give, mm. you know, because then you are on a, a new level. To see people on a new level, not being receivers, but yes. givers. Oh, so good. Oh, it touched me so much. Mm. So that picture of that woman, I have to, I have to look it up so many times. Mm. And praise God for being able to give, to train people, to help people, to climb out of poverty by using their own resources. You know, we only provide some training and some uh, some finances, but then they use their own talents. You know, God given talents. We say. Just wonderful. Uh, so, so it's really clear for people. Again, I think some of us are slower than than you. Um, so what would it be? Would it be like 50 people or 25 people in a group? And so if someone has a bad crop, they can't pay back what they're meant to pay. And so the others pay on their behalf. And then when they get a better crop, is that the sort of thing that happens? Yes. Yes. So and this is also very good in Bruni because, uh, you know, there have been, have been civil wars and much uh, struggle between people and people groups, ethnic groups. And now we mix them and they help each other. Yes. So maybe, as you say, the crop can be bad or maybe you didn't sell your, your uh, goods in, in right time and you are not able to pay back your loan. And then the others contribute. You know, they learn how to trust each other. And then uh, next month you have, uh, you have sold more and then you can pay back and, and maybe another one is in need. And then they help each other to grow, share, share stories and share... Uh, skills and share share money and uh, so that's wonderful to see so it's it's a whole discipleship network as well and and uh, it's just so many win-wins in the mix isn't it just fantastic and you've you'll have examples of of you know people then not just subsistence surviving working for their families but then they start employing other people is that right Yes, um, uh, I brought my daughter in uh, August in 2019 before the COVID-19 came. And she, uh, she said, I want to interview people because I heard all your stories, daddy, but I want to see and hear <laughs> myself. So, and everyone uh, she asked had uh, employed between two and seven people. Wow. And that was uh, so so interesting for me also because I didn't know this. Uh, probably many have not employed anyone, but this is what she found out. Everyone between two and seven. And she was very excited when she told me that uh, some of them uh, have even trained others who are not even become customers yet, but they will become customers. They use their skills to train others in their village because they want uh, their neighbors also to grow. And then uh, and another thing that uh, she found out was that uh, the poor people in, in the village uh, who were not helped by any NGO, by any microfinance, not by anyone, you know, they, they were given help by the groups uh, that we are training. So uh, then I found I was so happy because I, I, I say that instead of us, you know, going to the poorest of the poor uh, and helping them, we train those who are able to take new and more steps so that they can climb and have enough, you know, uh, that they can give to the poor there. Then that's much more sus uh, sustainable and it creates also a better environment in the village. Yeah. You know, I'm sat here and I've just got a, a really feel good smile on my face as I listen. You know, it's just so edifying. In fact, I've got a little tear in my eye because, uh, you know, you know that it's not statistics. And so let's say you're talking about 20,000 beneficiaries employing between two and seven people. Let's just take a lower end, take the, let's say they're employing three people each. So that's 60,000 people. Average Burundi family size is eight, which is a problem in itself. You know, six kids, 6.3 kids is the average. So you've got eight times those 6,000, that's 480,000. I mean, and that is people that are being provided food with and meaning and the, the dad's got less stress. He's not beating up the wife, which is a very prevalent problem out there. They're not drinking all their money. Often in Burundi at the end of the month, the, the guy gets paid maybe twenty. $30 and he goes out and buys a keg of beer and just drowns his sorrows and gives, you know, $5 left for the wife to feed the kids. I mean, there's so many social problems to the utter brokenness of it. And so it's hard for us to understand the extent of the ripple effect of, of righteousness sort of trickling down and impacting so many people and kids able to get so, oh, I love it. I love it. So, um, 
Yeah, any, any more stories? I've got, you, you were telling me about Innocent. Do you want to tell his story? Innocent, yeah, he was an uh, orphan, you know, and uh, we wanted to see how, uh, yeah, it was actually a Norwegian, uh, a Brunier who lives in Norway. She told us uh, she was running an orphanage. And uh, so we uh, went there and then uh, there was within guy, this guy named Innocent. Uh, he was able to translate uh, into uh, Kirundi, and uh, I saw he was a good, uh, he had leader abilities. So uh, instead of doing like most people when they visit an orphan uh, orphanage, they, uh, it, they feel like they are, you know, uh, animals, you know, in a zoo. Mm -hmm. You know, people come to, to see them and then they leave. Yeah. So we, we always went back. We wanted to give them... Uh, a sense of uh, belonging, you know, that we were kind of family. Then I saw this innocent, you know, really, really being uh, able. So uh, every time I went there, uh, I invited him to join me. So, uh, so he even uh, went into meetings with pastors and with people in high positions. Mm -hmm. and, and he learned and learned. And then, uh, and then he was able to, uh, to take a bachelor degree. And then uh, he had this heart of giving sharing giving always and uh, now we are giving him uh, uh, a leader position in in the training part mm -hmm. uh, so uh, to see to see how an orphan without uh, having any father or mother not being confirmed you know and yeah. uh, recognized and having an identity you know calling me a father i was there in his mar marriage and how being able to to give him this identity and belonging you know, and, and trust so that he uh, he could build up. Uh, he had built a very, very big organization before joining us. Now he wanted to learn microfinance, and now he wants to train people and, and uh, be like a father for many. Lovely. So good. Um, I'm just thinking um, about, you know, what scriptures really inspire you in this journey? Yeah, the most important, I think... Uh, is uh, Matthew 25, where uh, Jesus is talking about uh, uh, the talents, uh, where he gave five talents to one. And when he created five more talents, uh, Jesus said to him, uh, you are good and faithful servant. Mm -hmm. I found that very surprising. You know, uh, he didn't help any poor one. As far as we know, he only uh, uh, used those money in a faithful way. And then another one too, and he created two more into four, and Jesus called him good and faithful. Then with the third one, he had one talent, and he buried it. He did whatever in English. And then uh, he gave that talent back because he was afraid that he would uh, lose it. But that's the, Jesus called him. You, you, uh, uh, what was the, uh, lazy. Mm -hmm. And evil, lazy and evil, he called him. And I was thinking, wow, we really have to use our talents uh, to create money. This is what Jesus loves. Mm -hmm. And then next, next thing, he goes on. It just then Jesus shares about uh, the sheep, you know, divides the sheep from the goats, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how he wants us to care for the poor and needy. So this is one of the purpose by creating money. We need to care. You know, using our money, how can we develop the poor? Now I'm very lucky that I'm a banker. I thought I was unlucky because I, uh, God could not use the banker. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure in every uh, work, uh, there is something you can use to glorify God. Uh, and we are training people, you know, to uh, how to, you know, you are actually, uh, this is the next scripture, you are actually the church where you are working. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus says, you are Peter, I will build my rock on you. And what you bind uh, uh, here on earth will be bound in heaven, and what you lose will also be loosed in heaven. And he says what two and three agree on. So uh, he will give. So uh, I found out that actually I am the church. Arnie, you are the church mm -hmm. uh, in the bank. So I decided that, uh, of course, the CEO in, in the bank, he, is the, he, he has authority over everything, but not in the, in the spiritual round. And there is a spiritual round. 
uh, around every business, in every business, and in every city. So uh, with another Arnie who founded this microfinance, we have taken this authority in the spiritual, uh, both in the bank where we were working mm-hmm. and in the microfinance, saying we are the church. God, you have appointed us, you have called us, so this is to glorify you. And the signs that uh, we are Christians that shall follow is that we shall uh, heal the sick, for example. So I have told this to my colleagues in the bank and two of my closest colleagues sitting in the same room, very near to me, uh, dealing in the in international markets, have been healed by me laying my hands on them and, and saying, just proclaiming the healing because I am the church. Wow, yes. And, and this we are training also our staff, uh, but they haven't caught it uh, totally yet, but uh, we will go on and go on. When you go there, there's so many people suffering in Burundi. So many people who need healing uh, and help that they are actually God's chosen tool and they can use their spiritual authority to help people get out of sickness. Amen, brother. Preach it. So, I know know you've talked to me about this before. The vision is so big, isn't it? Because it's it's not just microfinance. It's being part of discipling and transforming a nation. Yes. Uh, Simon, I must say that uh, uh, God is going to transform Burundi. Uh, we have developed, uh, uh, you know, how to hear the voice from the Lord. My sheep hear my voice. And one day God told us uh, very clear that he will transform two nations, uh, that we, uh, he will use Hoga, that is Burundi and DRC, Congo. Mm. He said uh, they will grow. Uh, and they will, uh, you in the West will actually try to copy what uh, God is doing uh, in in Burundi, but we will not be able because uh, of our rigid uh, governance. Mm. And I I believe it from my heart, and I I find I also found it much more uh, joyful to live a life where I trust what the Lord is saying. Everything He says in the Bible, I I have chosen to believe it. And what he says to me, uh, it's much more fun than you see miracles and you can walk in them, you know, uh, miracles ready, uh, prepared beforehand so we can walk in them, Bible says. Yes. And I think he is creating a wave. You know, he's using this microfinance, Hauge family microfinance, Muryangu, but he's also using you. I've seen that in many ways, you know. He's using so many people, you know, building a foundation, building faith, building trust, giving a good uh, good foundation for him to work. Uh, and he is doing his job. So I think we are creating like a wave of people who from below who are given uh, new skills, uh, ability to create uh, wealth uh, and to disciple others, to, to train others, uh, to help those who are poor and needy. And this comforts God. So uh, I think he more and more wants to involve and see that people are growing and give us uh, authority over more and more as we are trustworthy in this model. So from my heart, uh, I think, uh, and then you need to start uh, in, in one area or you need to start a small. So you're training one people, one poor. Uh, I must say that when I came back from Burundi, I always uh, shared in schools and uh, how how my experience. So I, I saw that they were poor, helpless, and dependent, many, many people. So I wrote this on the board in the in the classroom once. I said, uh, wrote poor, helpless, and dependent. Then I saw PhD. Hmm. <laughs> and I was thinking, I started with PhD. I was thinking, when you have a PhD, then no one can tell you how to uh, behave because they know. They know what what is the result. And a poor person in Burundi, they know exactly what it's like, how to survive. So we had to transform their mindsets. Mm. And this is what is happening. You know, from being poor, we call them now productive poor. So you're no longer poor, you're productive. Mm. And they start producing, and they start, as I say, uh, to develop themselves, the community. Uh, And I think community by community, things are changing. And people are seeing the light. It gives hope. 
Last time now, uh, our leader was in the Kirundo province, where uh, we are the only microfinance there, actually. Mm -hmm. There is one for military. And, and uh, political leaders, they were so happy for what we have done. We've only been in one and a half years, but they can see the results now. You know, how people are, uh, have been trained and, and climbing out of poverty. So it takes time, but it will happen slowly, yes. transforming the mindsets, and then people start the acting. And can you also believe for a small child, you know, growing up in a family where the father is a beggar? Mm. You know, it's not good for them. In Norway, we know that if the father is, uh, is getting money from the social, uh, you know, uh, system, then the children also do. Yeah. So we have to get people to work, you know. And then the father can teach skills to the children instead, you know, teaching how to beg, you know. And he's a good role model. And we have Hans Nielsen Hoog as the role model transforming yeah. Norway. So, uh, so I really believe in it. I don't know if, uh, if it will happen th this year or, or in 10 years. Can a nation be saved in a day? Mm. Yes, says the Lord. So uh, I find it so funny. Uh, and uh, joyful to go those steps and say, Lord, it's up to you, but I will do my part. Yes. Do you know what, Arne, I, if I think of one word that comes out this last uh, 45 or whatever minutes is, is I feel inspired. You just actually on the money, you know, we've called this podcast Inspired because we want to tell there's so much bad news and grimness and depressive stuff going on in the world, but there's also beautiful stuff Beautiful stuff done in the name of Jesus, for the glory of Jesus, by people from all walks of life. And you are absolutely embodying that. And I am thrilled to be a part of your journey and uh, want to support you in it. So I would love it if people got excited about this to, to want to be in touch with you. And, you know, who knows what comes of connections? That's Kingdom Connections. Again, that's how I dream of, of seeing us all working together. How can people get in touch with you? Do you want to plug anything, a website, or, 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 or you just go for that now? Yes, uh, our website in Norway is uh, Hauge, H A U G E, micro uh, dot no. Dot no for Norway. Okay. And uh, listen, just give us some, you know, if you, your, uh, your parting words to us before we call it a day. Okay. My, uh, I'm saying that uh, don't look down on a poor person uh, because uh, they, they have possibilities, but they don't. Uh, they have abilities, but they don't always get the possibilities. Mm. Uh, so we need to uh, treat everyone like Jesus says. You know, uh, He is in everyone, yeah. and He cares so much. Uh, and uh, but we are not looking for um, and for those people who are not willing. We only go for those who are willing. Mm -hmm. But together we can create a wave. I say that there are so many Christians in Burundi. If we can uh, not only think of our own, vi own vision, but if we can work together. And you are a role model there, Simon. Mm -hmm. If we can work together, you know, involve each other, include each other, I think it touches the Lord's heart. That's right. So, so together I think we can transform this nation, Burundi, to become the role model that God has called it to be. And uh, people will be shocked. It's Burundi and Congo, people are laughing at in Norway. People yeah. don't see that how these people can be transformed yeah. with all those uh, civil wars and problems they have, you know, always uh, an issue. But this will change. Amen. So, so we stand together, Simon, and uh, I invite everyone else to join in. Yes, yes, you are all yeah. very, very welcome. <laughs> Great stuff, Arnie. Well, thanks so much. Listen, everybody, I hope you've been inspired. If you have been inspired, I'd love you to gossip this podcast. I'd love you to get other people to sign up. And you can get hold of me on simongilbo.com or the various social media uh, platforms. But uh, next week, we've got another superb guest. So get ready to be inspired again. I look forward to it. Bye, Arnie. Bye-bye. Thank you.